our latest and greatest dream. It is July, and Walt Disney is standing at Disneyland's main gate in Anaheim, California. As the pavement cools in the early evening dim, a warm, dry wind is blowing in from the desert. Walt is in the middle of the busiest week of his life, and tonight is his night to enjoy himself. The park is almost finished. In a few days it will open to the public. Tonight will be a sort of soft opening with exclusive, invitation-only guests arriving any minute. Checking his watch, Walt lights a cigarette and stares out at the nearly empty parking lot, trying to imagine what it will look like in a few days when the television cameras and the crowds arrive. Smoking his cigarette down, he tosses it in a nearby trash can. There's always one within a dozen feet by Walt's insistence on cleanliness, and lights another. He stands there, waiting for his honored guests. Among them are Hollywood luminaries like MGM head Louis B. Mayer, Gary Cooper, Spencer Tracy, and Cary Grant. Others are friends and colleagues, the Imagineers at Wed and their families, and Walt's own family members was Walt and Lillian's 30th wedding anniversary, and tonight is as much a party to celebrate that as it is to celebrate the park. Excited, Walt walked down from his apartment over the fire station on Main Street to the entrance gate a little early. Again, checking his watch, the appointed arrival time is mere minutes away and so far no early bird guests have arrived. Walt looks back up Main Street to Sleeping Beauty Castle. As the sun sets and the park's lights take over, the sound of hammers and buzz saws still echo. Despite the party tonight and the opening in three days, work is still going on throughout the park as crews rush to finish everything. After breaking ground a year ago, construction started slow. Walt visited the site almost daily, and for the first several months, all there was to see was leveled dirt. The foundations and concrete were slow as well, and by the time the Disneyland show aired its seventh episode in early December of last year, almost half the original $5 million budget was spent. Walt and Roy still sought corporate investors for the park, but so far only had a few bites, like Walt's old friends at the Santa Fe Railroad sponsoring the park's train ride. All these things changed on December 15th, though. The Disneyland show had been a wild success. Since the premiere in late October, the show continued to grow in the ratings, and the critics' response was positive as well. The most recent episode was an hour-long, behind-the-scenes documentary for the upcoming film 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, called Operation Under Sea. The episode worked as an advertisement and extended trailer for the movie, but it was also a rare, for the time, behind-the-scenes look at the magic of movie making. The episode would go on to win the Emmy in a few months for Best Individual Program. That next episode, on December 15th, was the big one. When developing the show, the television team took the names of all different characters that could fit under the concept of Frontierland to develop episodes based on their stories. Legendary figures like Paul Bunyan and John Henry were included with the historical figures of Lewis and Clark and Davy Crockett. It was by sheer luck that the team drew the last one, Crockett, as their first subject. The Crockett episodes were planned as a trilogy, each one telling a story from a period of Davy Crockett's life, from his youth on the frontier to his death at the Alamo. Walt visited the set in Tennessee last September, a month before Disneyland's first episode aired. He told the director and crew to take their time and do the show right, even telling them to reshoot a scene where he could see a zipper on a bear costume. On the premiere episode of the show in October, Walt introduced the Frontierland section with the Davy Crockett story. Next was a clip of Fess Parker, the actor playing Crockett, performing the theme written for the episodes, The Ballad of Davy Crockett, with a small band. 
When episode 8, the first of the Davy Crockett episodes, finally aired in mid-December, the audience had been primed. The reaction to the Crockett show was nothing short of a phenomenon. The theme song went to the top of the popular music charts, selling over 7 million copies of the record by June. Coonskin caps like Crockett wore sold in the millions and became a national symbol, not to mention a recurring icon of the era. Anytime you see a bunch of kids in coonskin caps, you know it's the mid-1950s. Westerns were already a popular film genre by 1954, and legendary television programs like Lone Ranger, Gene Autry, and Roy Rogers were already airing. But there was something in that old Disney magic which transcended the genre. A couple weeks after the first Davy Crockett episode of Disneyland, Walt received a letter from ABC executive Robert Kintner. The network was exercising their option to pick up a second Disney television show, this time for a five-day-a-week, one-hour daytime show for children. To entice Walt, the network offered to add another $2.4 million investment into Disneyland. He agreed. The concept for the show dated back years to some of Disney's original proposals to the networks, and they already had the perfect name, the Mickey Mouse Club. The name dated back to a PR gimmick used by Disney's studio in the Depression to sell their films to theaters. They offered older cartoons and a curated program of games and entertainment. The concept worked to draw weekend morning audiences for cheap children's entertainment. Now, Walt's TV team would produce a similar concept to air weekdays on ABC. While the studio started work on the new show, Walt was deep in Disneyland. Every day he could, he drove out to the park and walked the grounds. He watched the earth movers level ground to the park, raise the berm around its perimeter, watch the foundations laid, and by early 1955, he was already halfway through his budget. There isn't one thing you'd call terrific out there right now, he told Harper Goff one day, crying, according to Goff. The rush for more money was constant. The extra influx of cash from the ABC option on Mickey Mouse Club helped, but Walt was burning through the money faster than he could find more. Walt never found enough money. Even now, standing at the main gate mere days from opening, the park is unfinished. They ran out of money and time to get it finished for the ambitious one-year deadline. Most of Tomorrowland is an empty lot of packed dirt. Adventureland is largely empty, with just the Jungle Cruise, and even that attraction falls far short of Walt's dreams for it. Fantasyland's Canal Boats of the World is devoid of theming. The rest of Fantasyland is also unfinished, with a temporary generic medieval tournament facade used for all the attractions, instead of the elaborate facades that were originally planned. Checking his watch for the hundredth time, Walt tosses the empty pack of cigarettes in the bin and opens a new one. The appointed time of arrival was 15 minutes ago, and still no one has arrived. Grumbling, Walt paces the area outside the gate, craning to look up the road towards the freeway. Mickey Mouse, sculpted into the plants covering the berm that surrounds the park, grins down at Walt like he knows something. Walt scowls back and walks back to the main gate to wait. The budget for the park, as it stands now, is closer to $17 million total. Six months ago, it was almost half of that. Walt's need for perfection, overseeing as many aspects of the work as he could personally, of course caused delays, like when he ordered work redone to meet his standards. But while he did rush the workers and suggest changes and fixes, he also ate lunch with them in a catering tent and was not above picking up a hammer himself, if necessary. That was when Walt could be on hand to oversee the work. Despite his desire to monitor everything himself, other duties called him away. He tried to offload as much responsibility at the studio as he could, but he still followed the development of the studio's projects. In February, the first 20 weeks of the Mickey Mouse Club outlines were finished, and by April, Walt memoed Hal Adelquist, one of the studio execs in charge of the show, detailing the children Mouseketeers and adult Mooseketeers concept. That same month, employees counted 9,500 people stopping at the park for information. 
despite the lack of any sign indicating the place was Disneyland. Almost 10,000 people in a single weekend. Part of that interest was a result of the Disneyland television show. Walt's idea to use the show as an advertisement for the park worked even better than he could have imagined. The ads for the opening day telecast, live on ABC, sold out in March, shortly after the Tomorrowland series entitled Man in Space debuted. This was over two and a half years before the Soviets launched Sputnik, the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth. President Eisenhower ordered his rocket scientists to obtain a recording of the program and to watch it. Meanwhile, Walt and Roy gave tours through the nascent park for potential investors. While this allowed Walt to be in the park, he also had to focus on wooing sponsorships and investments from the executives of Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Ford, or whatever company it was this week. Some of these companies took the bait, sponsoring attractions. In addition to the Santa Fe sponsoring the railroad, Richfield Oil gave money for the Autopia attraction, and American Motors sponsored the Circa Rama film and its presentation. When he wasn't at the studio, overseeing work at the park, or giving tours, Walt visited the Aero Development Company to check on the ride mechanisms for Snow White's Adventures, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, and the King Arthur Carousel. Walt had George Whitney, one of his amusement park experts, touring the country to buy more rides, arcade games, and other amusement park standards. He sent WED employee Nat Weinkoff to Germany to find cars for Autopia. He pressed Ward Kimball for his scale lawn train, but Kimball refused. Walt did say he could come to the park when it was closed on Mondays and drive it all he wanted to. After Kimball still said no, Walt then turned to William Casey Jones, his old railroad enthusiast friend, to help him find the appropriate engine and carriages. By spring, WED employees, construction crews, and contractors finished enough of the park for Walt to give a preview day. Members of the studio's penthouse club, mostly executives and WED people, were invited to the park for an afternoon barbecue with beer. Walt ran the train, giving guests a ride around the park. He also studied their reactions to everything, noting what needed improvement or plussing. Seven weeks ago, rehearsals began for the opening day ceremonies live on ABC. Every Sunday night since, the crews have been practicing everything they can do for the day, from the live dancers and music, to the parade, the dedication, coordinating the telecast, camera placements, and of course direction. The telecast's director suffered a nervous breakdown and will have to direct the show from his hospital bed in three days. Walt still stands at the front gate, welcoming the first few guests. They tell him not to worry about the other guests. A bad accident on the freeway resulted in a massive traffic jam. As if to prove them right, headlights begin streaming into the parking lot. Car after car, full of Walt's personally invited guests, file in, emptying their occupants, clad in their best evening wear, onto the tarmac in front of Walt's park. He greets them all in turn and has them explore Main Street while the rest of the guests arrive. Once the crowd is gathered, Walt leads them all to the Mark Twain Riverboat, where the evening's festivities will begin. After drinks and some light food, Walt loosens up, shaking off not only the stress of the early evening, but the stress of the past year. Everyone loves the park and is fascinated by Walt's creation. He uncharacteristically overindulges. By the end of the night, a tipsy Walt is standing on the balcony in the Golden Horseshoe Saloon, pinging ricochets from imaginary six-shooters he's firing at the stage. His daughter, Diane, drives him home, while he rolls a park map into a cylinder and plays it like a trumpet, singing a song and passing out asleep in the car, still clutching the map. On the following night, Walt will be honored with a special ceremony at the Hollywood Bowl. Disney actors, Fess Parker and Buddy Ebsen from Davy Crockett, Sterling Holloway, legendary voice actor who will go on to voice Winnie the Pooh, and Cliff Edwards, original voice of Jiminy Cricket, will all perform for the audience and speak about working with Walt. He will receive a silver-clad coonskin cap from the governor of California. No, not that one. Get him out of here. Yes, that guy. Walt will be named the state's honorary governor, and the ceremony will be repeated again on Friday, July 15th. 
The next day, with the countdown to opening measuring mere hours, Walt decides two key things. First, he will need costumed characters of the animated classics. He calls the Ice Capades, who have a touring show featuring Disney characters, and has them send over everything they've got. He also decides to dig the giant squid prop from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea out of storage and put it on display. The foam rubber is falling apart, and there's no display set up for it, but that doesn't stop Walt. With wet employee Ken Anderson and two others, Walt helps patch the prop and paint a backdrop for it, setting it up for guests tomorrow. He will not sleep that night. Instead, he works until dawn when he has to leave for the airport to pick up the VIP guests for opening day. To all who come to this happy place, Thank you.